you settle that. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. If you would like to stand, we're going to start by singing um, this song that reminds us about the fact that we can be, have everything well with our soul, even when everything around us doesn't feel like it's going brilliantly.
morning to you all. Welcome in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, as we read in Mark chapter 10, did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And that's why we can have hope and confidence this morning, because of what Jesus has done for us. We can rest knowing that he is all that we need this morning. And so it's great we can meet together and praise God through Jesus. And we're going to give praise in a minute as we sing. But before that, as always, there's a few church announcements. So firstly, let me invite you to stay for tea and for coffee after the service finishes. It's always nice, isn't it, to meet up with each other and uh, or maybe meet for the first time. So please do stay for refreshments later and continue fellowship with each other if you can. We return back here at 6pm for our evening service and our assistant pastor Tiago will be taking that, continuing in the book of Luke. Our midweek meeting this week is our ever important monthly church prayer meeting, an important evening where we meet together, share communion together and of course pray together and prayer is so important isn't it? So do come to that, let me encourage you, that's on Wednesday 7.30 to 8.30 here at the church. And of course, there's another chance to pray again the day after for those who can on our Thursday 2 p.m. Uh, um, prayer meeting. That's here again at the church. On Saturday, at 2 p.m. to 5 p.m., John and June Chillingworth has invited anyone who wishes to go for tea and cake and fellowship. That's on Saturday 8th of October. So please ask the church office for more details if you wish to go to that. Finally, we have an event on Friday the 14th of October called Reality Check with Todd Alexander. It's great for the younger ones especially and a great opportunity to invite friends and family and neighbours to come along. I don't really know what will be in the performance, being an illusionist, you might saw somebody in half, I'm not quite sure, but I can safely say it will be a great evening. So do come along to that on Friday the 14th of October to find out what it's all about. And if you can bake something to be served during the interval, or help with car parking, then please do have a word with Dan Nichols at the end of the service, or there is a sign-up sheet in the activity hall just next door there. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can come and meet this morning to praise you. We come thanking you that you save us, knowing that we are sinners. Even this week, we've let you down. Like Paul, we confess that what we want to do, we do not do. And what we hate, we do. Thank you that through Jesus, you forgive us. Help us to rejoice in that wonderful truth this morning. Be with all those taking part today. Thrill and stir our hearts for you. And may we be, as always, very careful to give you all the honour and all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand now as we sing our first song, Faithful One, So Unchanging, and then remain standing as we'll sing straight after, give thanks with a grateful heart.
morning. We're going to pray in a moment. The first song that we sung, it is, it is Well, Did You Know That, was written by a man called Horatio Stafford. Spafford. He, um, he was a very rich businessman. He lost his wife and three of his children in a, in a boat accident sailing across the Atlantic. He lost his business. He lost everything he had. And having gone through all of that, then he could write, it is well, it is well with my soul. Can you say that in your heart this morning? It is well, it is well with my soul. Hallelujah. We're just going to start by reading before we pray together. I'd like to read from Jeremiah chapter 24, verses 6 to 7. And here God is, is speaking of his people. I will set my eyes on them for good and I will bring them back to this land. I will build them up and not tear them down. I will plant them and not pluck them up. I will give them a heart to know that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return to me with their whole heart. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the truth that we've sung, that we can truly know that it is well with our soul. We thank you for what we've just read. We, we, we ask for, for, for those who, are, uh, who know you but are not in communion with you at the moment, but you, that you would bring us back into relationship, that you'd bring us into relationship with you continually. We ask that you would give us a real heart to know you, to know you more, to know more of you. We ask that you would give us such a hunger and a thirsting after you, after your righteousness. We thank you that you satisfy our every need. We thank you that you are all sufficient. And we thank you that through you we can truly say, it is well, it is well with my soul. We thank you that you can say, oh my sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. We thank you for Jesus who came to pay the price for our sins so that we can truly say, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, my sin, I bear it no more. Father, we thank you we can come together this morning before you and we pray for all those, those in our church who are not able to be here. For whatever reason, we pray for those who are, who are unwell. We ask that you would heal, that you would strengthen, that you would build up, that you would encourage. We thank you that you are so faithful, Father God. We pray for our nation. Oh, how we need to pray for our nation. We pray as a country that you would bring us back to you. We pray for our Prime Minister, that you would give her your wisdom. We pray for our new King, that you would give him your wisdom, that he would see something of you and of your glory, that he would turn to you, Father God. We pray for the situation in Ukraine. It seems ever more desperate. We thank you that you are absolutely sovereign and in control. We pray for all those Ukrainian Christians who are many still in the country, that you would give them such an awareness of of your presence and give them opportunity to speak of you. Finally, Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to come th together this morning. Please give us hearts ready to receive your word, ears to hear, hearts ready to worship, and please help us that in everything we do this morning, it may give glory and honour to you. In your name, amen. Thanks, John. Well, Romans chapter 15, verse 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. And so we can trust in him who never lets us down, never breaks any of his promises. That's something that we can be assured of. And, then, and so with, with that in mind, let's uh, stand and sing our children's song now. God, he always keeps his promises. Is this on, Philip? Oh, it is now. Okay, I've recruited some help. So you get me to wave at you today. We're going to teach you a song that we learned in Holiday Club at the beginning of the summer holidays. Um, 
And as John has said, it's all about how God can be fully trusted. If he says something, he keeps his word. What he says is true, and we can know that he's always going to keep it. So the chorus, I'm going to just quickly run through the words. Can we have the words on the screen for the chorus, please? Okay, so we're going to point to God. So God, he always keeps his promises. Oh, no, can we have the, sorry, I realized that's the verse first. Can I have the chorus, please? There we go. Now we're going in the right place. So we're going to talk about our God. So our God is good and true. He cannot lie to me and you. We can be sure of this. God always keeps his promises. Now, I know that there are some young people who were at the Holiday Club. So if you'd like to come and help us do the actions, and that would be super encouraging. Um, for the verses, as we go through, you'll just need to follow us. Um, but we're going to teach you the chorus now. Um, do you have your mic on? Do you want to just check, check Chloe's <laughs> mic is working as well? Hello. Hello. We didn't have, a ti have time to do a mic Hello. check before. Hello. Hello. Okay, Dad, let's have a go. Okay, so it goes like this. Our God is Each of the verses goes through a promise that God, that God gave to somebody and how it was fulfilled. So the first verse goes like this, and then the verse's tune is all the same. So if we teach you the first one, the actions obviously change for each verse. Okay. Oh God, he always keeps his promises. He said the sons of Abraham would be more than the grains of sand, and so Sun would set. 
again sorry about that um, we're going to read from Acts chapter 20 verses 1 to 12 Acts 20 verses 1 to 12 when the uproar had ended Paul sent for the disciples and after encouraging them said goodbye and set out for Macedonia he traveled through that area speaking many words of encouragement to the people and finally arrived in Greece, where he stayed three months. Because some Jews had plotted against him, just as he was about to sail for Syria, he decided to go back through Macedonia. He was accompanied by Sopater, son of Paris, from Berea, Aristarchus from Sic- and Secondus from Thessalonica, Gaius from Derby, Timothy also, and Tychicus and Trophimus from the province of Asia. These men went on ahead and waited for us at Troas. But we sailed from Philippi and after the festival of unleavened bread and five days later joined the others at Troas where we stayed seven days. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people and because he intended to leave the next day, kept on talking until midnight. There were many lamps in the upstairs room where we were meeting. Seated in a window was a young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. When he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. Paul went down, threw himself on the young man and put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed, he said, he's alive. Then he went upstairs again and broke bread and ate. After talking until daylight, he left. The people took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted. It was certainly working John hard this morning. Put a good shift in. Um, let's stand and sing again, during which the kids will go out to their Sunday classes and little ones to crash. Uh, Let's stand and sing, by faith we see the hand of God, and after we've sung this, Andy's going to come up and speak. By faith we see the hand of God In the light of creation's grand design In the light of those who prove his faithfulness Who walk by faith and not by sight By faith we others from the earth With the power of his power
you all. Please uh, do get your Bibles in front of you. We're going to be looking at Acts chapter 20 together. And before we do that, I'll pray. Oh, Father, we thank you that we can gather as your people, that we can open your word, that we have it translated into our language. Lord, we can read these words, and we can hear these words together. Father, we thank you that you have given us a living word, a powerful word. We ask, Lord, please, that you would help us by your spirit to understand what we hear, what we read. Lord, to take it to heart that these things might bear fruit in our lives. We thank you that in the pages of this book, your precious son, our saviour, is revealed to us that we might know him, that we might know you, that we might be like him. Lord, do that work in each of our lives, we pray. Amen. So do you love church? Do you love church? I mean, why are you actually here? Why do you come on a Sunday morning? What is it about church that keeps you coming? Good questions, I think. I, I looked at uh, one website this week I stumbled upon uh, from a Christian organization that works with university students. And they had a page about what to look for in a church. The main benefit of getting involved in a local church, according to this organization, which I will not name, was, I quote... Being part of a church can be a great way to find support and guidance from different generations of people and grow within a diverse community. End of. Are you looking for a new church? This is the advice they give to students. Top things to look for in a new church. Number one, inclusive and open. The key words here are affirming and open-minded it's what you want in a church. As a friend of mine used to quip, the problem with being too open-minded is that your brain tends to fall out, correct? Number two, though, perhaps this is better, active within the community and beyond. I mean, that's good, right? I mean, it's important. It's an important thing to be active in our community, but maybe not more important than what they put as number three, and these are their words, I'm just reading off their website, serious about theology and worship, open brackets, but not too serious, close brackets. I have to say, I couldn't believe, actually, that I'd read it. And then finally, number four, number four, a friendly priest or minister. Well, we've got that nailed, 
haven't we? <laughs> We're good. I did check, and we still do have the review on Google Maps. I don't know if you ever look at this. Go have a read of them. Someone gave us a five-star review uh, a few years back uh, and commented, beautiful church, beautiful surroundings, hilarious priest, memorable service. <laughs> I don't think this person even actually turned up. Okay, but anyway, that's their impression. It's a head scratcher, isn't it? But what is it that makes a, a local church a great church to belong to? What makes a great Christian community? It's important we look at that and think about that. And I think what we have here in Acts chapter 20, the whole chapter actually, is Luke giving us, giving us one of his little snapshots of the church. I mean, it's a fairly big snapshot. We've had this before, Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter, uh, sorry, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 4, where Luke's done this. He's giving us an insight into what was really great, actually, about the churches, and particularly now about the churches that we've seen planted uh, as Paul has traveled with his co-workers around quite a large territory. What's great about these churches? These are churches all across the areas of Achaia, Macedonia, Asia and Galatia. That's basically uh, most of Greece and Turkey. So it's a large area. And, and these churches, there's something common about them that's just great. So let's take a look at this first part of the wonderful portrait as we get it this morning. Here in the first 12 verses of chapter 20, we are told, first of all, about a short tour that Paul and his companions take through Greece and Macedonia followed by this intriguing little stay in the city of Troas, which I'm sure is like, in your minds at the moment, the highlight. What's he going to say about that? So let's look at the first part then. We'll, we'll, hold, we'll, hold, we'll hang fire. The first six verses, let's look at them again. It's a, it's, a, it's a curious little passage, this. And we're asking the question, what was this church like? What was this wonderful church actually like? Have a look at verse 1 with me. When the uproar had ended, Paul sent for the disciples and, after encouraging them, said goodbye and set out for Macedonia. He travelled through that area, speaking many words of encouragement to the people, and finally arrived in Greece, where we stayed for three months. Because the Jews made a plot against him, just as he was about to sail for Syria, he decided to go back through Macedonia. He was accompanied by Sopater, son of uh, Pyrrhus from Berea, Aristarchus and Secundus from Thessalonia, Thessalonica, Gaius from Der Derby, Timothy also, and Tychicus and Trophimus from the province of Asia. These men went on ahead and waited for us at Troas, but we sailed from Philippi after the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and five days, days later joined the others at Troas where we stayed for seven days. It's another one of these sort of traveling itineraries, isn't it? But let's, let's look at this. What was the church like? That's the question, remember, that we're asking. Let's just go through these verses. Just, just have a look at them with me, and let's just see what's going on here. So verse 1 tells us, after the dust has settled, remember from last week we looked at this riot that happened in Ephesus. Paul says farewell to the brothers and sisters there. He encourages them, and then he travels to Macedonia. So that's across that little sea there to the sort of to, to the northern part of what we call Greece today, Macedonia. And this is the home to churches of like that, that we know the names of, like Philippi, and Thessalonica, and Berea. Remember those names? And then in verse two, we're told uh, that Paul conducts again this ministry of encouragement. That's what he's doing as he travels down across, visiting all of these churches uh, down into Greece. No doubt, visiting Athens. And Corinth, other churches we're familiar with. Now, what's he doing here? Well, the word encouragement here, it means to exhort them. Well, that's probably a more confusing word than encourage, isn't it? It means to call them to stand firm. Think about that word, encouragement. It carries the meaning quite well, actually, the English word, if you look at it. It literally means to encourage that is to inspire courage, to inspire strength and bravery in these people, to encourage them. Paul knows, and we'll see more of this in the coming weeks as we, as we carry on into Acts, 
He knows this is most likely his last visit, and he's urging these churches, as he goes to each one, to stand firm, be strong. He's not always going to be with them to oversee them. And both he and they are quite familiar with what goes on in the world around them, the pressures that will come on them, jealousy from some quarters that come, anti-Christian feelings that erupt uh, against God's people in these various towns. Remember what we saw last week, the gospel provokes opposition. He's encouraging them in the light of that. And in verse 3, we, we, we read that three months later, he travels back up again through Macedonia, and he does this instead of sailing directly to Syria. And we're told by Luke here that a, a plot has been hatched against Paul. So this persecution's going on, isn't it? Evidently, Paul's aim in an ideal world would have been to return to base and then to visit Jerusalem. That's where he's headed. But if there's a plot, think about it, if there's a plot afoot amongst the Jews, all of whom who are going for the festivals in Jerusalem, the one place you don't want to be if they're trying to kill you is on a, in, on a boat for several weeks surrounded by uh, a murderous group of people trying to bump you off. So, so walking seems to be the wise option for Paul. Verse 4 lists those who are accompanying him. I think this is quite a key verse. Have a look at it. It's showcasing some of these brothers who are accompanying Paul, his hand-selected ministry team. You've got Sopater, or Sopater, who's a Berean, yeah? Remember Berea? The people who are Berean, who check everything out by the word of God. Aristarchus and Secundus, they're Thessalonians, also from up in Macedonia. Gaius, he's from Derby. Isn't Derby the place where Paul was stoned to death outside the city? Then you've got Timothy from Lystra, Tychicus and Trophimus from the province of Asia. And obviously you've got Luke here who's, who's writing this account, isn't he? He's probably from Philippi. Remember Philippi? Well, for, verse 5 tells us that Paul and probably Luke, because of the us in the verse, travel, they walk onwards together. The others travel by sea to Troas, where they're all planning to meet up again. And then we're told in verse 6 that they end up spending seven days together there. So we've walked through the verses now. So what does that tell us about the churches that Paul has been instrumental in, plan, in, in planting all over this area of the world? Now, we know that these churches had their problems too. I mean, we, we read through some of the letters and you're, you're left there thinking, wow, I mean, I thought, I thought we had some issues, but they've got some serious issues going on in these churches, churches like Corinth and, and, and others. But first of all, here's the good things. It tells us, first of all, they had unity. There was a wonderful unity. They all know that they belong to the same church with a capital C. They're all members of God's people. And they know each other, too. You've got a team here that is spread out from all of these different churches that Paul's visited and seen planted. A mixed team from all over the place. And you've got Jews working with Gentiles. That's quite staggering in the culture. They're all working for the cause of the gospel. They're living out the truth of a gospel that breaks down walls and barriers between communities and races and ethnicities. Listen to how Paul writes about the church in Thessalonica up there in Macedonia. He says this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. You became imitators of us and of the Lord in spite of severe suffering. You welcomed the message with joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith's become known everywhere. So you get the picture of these churches, don't you? They know of each other's exist existence. They're hearing the stories as what's happening in all the towns around them where churches have been planted, where the work of the Lord is going on. And they're loving each other. And constantly throughout his letters, Paul calls these believers, all of these believers from these churches, his brethren. He calls them his brothers and sisters. They are his family. They all have the same father. And he writes a letter of thanks to the Philippians 
who've been sending him again and again aid to help him with ministering elsewhere. Here is a church. Remember, we went through the letter to the Philippians. They are as excited as Paul is to see churches planted and growing elsewhere, not just on their patch, but elsewhere in the world. It's an outward-looking, united church, isn't it? That leads us to another point, though. It tells us that they were a generous church. It seems that actually one of the reasons for this tour, going through these churches for Paul, if you, especially if you read the end of the book of Romans, one of his reasons was to collect an offering. The church in Jerusalem was struggling. It was poor. There were problems, famines and such like. And it was these Gentile churches who were excited to express generosity towards them. And they wanted to do it together. Paul writes to the church in Corinth, who actually had been tremendously generous themselves, the Corinthians. And he writes to them to tell them, and to boast really, I suppose, about the churches further north in Macedonia. He says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. It's a wonderful little uh, insight here. Now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given to the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify, they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. What an amazing paragraph that is. That's generosity, isn't it? Thirdly, they were producing, they were producing believers of caliber. I mean, some quality men and women here. And that's truly remarkable, actually, considering how short some of Paul's visits were to some of these places. Again, he writes to the church in Rome saying this, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church in Sencrea, that's near Corinth. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and to give her any help she might need from you, for she has been a great help to many people, including me. She's a legend, Phoebe. Paul speaks of Timothy as being like a son to him. He trusts, he trusts Timothy with troubleshooting difficult situations. That's something, isn't it? A young man trusts him to sort out false teachers, to make sure elders get appointed in churches. It seems that Paul is quite confident to send these young men, and they're young, new believers, many of them, to send them ahead of, them, of him in his place sometimes. These men listed in verse 4, they go to needy places where Paul can't go himself. He trusts them to be his mouth, his hands and his feet. He says of Titus, listen to this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, I thank God who put it into the heart of Titus, the same concern I have for you. Titus not only welcomed our appeal, but he's coming to you with much enthusiasm and on his own initiative. We are sending him along with a brother who is praised by all the churches for his service in the gospel. See how Paul's just welling up with pride over these young men, isn't he? He loves them, he trusts them. They are quality, quality young men and women. These churches produced fellow workers of Paul who were capable and faithful, who were a huge help and a support to him in the work of missions. In short, these verses bear witness to the fact that the gospel, which has been preached all over this part of the world, is a powerful and life-changing message. This is not a church that simply existed to be as inclusive as possible, to give a warm welcome to people, to make sure that people feel like they belong and do some good in their community. Good things, though, those are. We shouldn't be less than that as a church, should we? In the right way. By the way, though, you can get all of those things from your local Weight Watchers group. This was a community of people whose lives had been turned upside down. The gospel had, had been delivered to them. It had come to them through these messengers. 
They'd received it with open hearts. The Lord had opened and moved their hearts. They'd become aware of their sin and their desperate need of salvation. They'd become aware of their need of God's forgiveness. And they discovered the good news that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, had given his life to pay their debts, to bring peace between them and God, to bring joy, to begin, bring the hope of eternal life. Do you know that hope? That is a wonderful hope. It's a life-changing hope. And what else could these people do but repent, leave their lives of sin, and put their trust in him? I wonder if you've ever come to that point. Made aware of your sin, put your trust in God's saviour. If you do that, your life is never the same. It's never the same again after that. Paul describes that remarkable change that happens when he writes to the church in Thessalonica. And he tells, he tells them that the story of their dramatic conversion has become known far and wide. Listen to what he says. He says, people know how you turned, from, uh, turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. These are a people that know salvation, who have left behind all those old things they used to love and they've clung on to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. So many men and women, recent converts, but they are faithful. They're mature, they're generous, they're united in the cause of the gospel. That's the snapshot of the church. It's beautiful, isn't it? Isn't it exciting? So why was the church like that? Why was it like that? That's, I think, what we see in verses 7 to 12. Luke seems to be using this little story of what happens in Troas to share with us the reason why these churches were so active, so mature, so faithful, so generous and united. Take a look with me. It's a great little story here. Look at verse 7. On the first day of the week, this is them in Troas, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke until midnight. Sorry, Paul spoke to the people because he intended to leave the next day and he kept talking until midnight. There were many lamps in the upstairs room where we were meeting and seated in a window was a young man named Eutychus who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. When he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. It's a wonderful little insight into the church again here. How did the first century church operate? Well, this is the first time actually recorded here of a church gathering on a Sunday instead of the Sabbath. God's people gathering on a Sunday. And their reason for gathering is to break bread together. That is, I think, to eat a meal together as well as to remember the Lord by celebrating his supper, just as we do. You've got to remember, this would have been a work day for most people. And yet, isn't it staggering? As soon as they clock off from work, some of these people probably, you know, slaves, household slaves and servants, as soon as they clock off from work, maybe 6 p.m., sun's going down, these brothers and sisters come and gather together. They grab a bite to eat together, and then they listen to hours of teaching. Hours of teaching. Paul's got a lot that he wants to say, clearly. And he, again, he knows this is his last chance to say it. He will soon de depart, and he has to leave them with his word of encouragement. He wants to instill courage in them. But this word is a long one, isn't it? He goes on until midnight. I hope you haven't got any plans for the afternoon. Dr. Luke, who's writing this, adds more details. See, He says it's late. He says they're on the third floor here. It's an upper room above someone's house. And the room is no doubt small. And it's packed full of people. We're in a hot country here. And hence people are seated by the windows trying to get a little bit of fresh air. And added to this, you've got a lot of lamps burning, says Luke. You know, the oxygen that's left in that room, it's all being burned up. Yeah, no chimneys here. 
just lots of lamps everywhere, burning, oil lamps or something. Not a lot of oxygen. And Eutychus is a young man as well. Poor old Eutychus. He's probably only about 12 to 14 years old, most people, most people reckon, going by the words used to describe him. And you know what it's like. It is apparently a fact, so my wife, t- wife tells me, that teenagers do in fact need more sleep. They need this. He's probably had a hard day too. No doubt he works, actually, young Eutychus. And Paul's going long. I mean, he's going long, even for Paul probably here. With all the best will in the world. Poor old Eutychus, he can't, he can't help it. He's starting to doze off. It's not that he's not interested. It's just that there's all of these other factors, aren't there? I mean, I can relate. Can't you relate to this? Just feeling this? You know, there's a number of Disney animations, okay, uh, that I don't know the end of. You know why? Because <laughs> I've had a long and busy Sunday morning and then a wonderful lunch that my beloved wife cooks and apple crumble after it and all of this food's in the stomach. I've had it, I've had it. And then they, then they turn the lights off in a room <laughs> where I'm sat on a comfortable seat and I'm gone. It's not because I'm not interested, you see. I'd love to know how they end. <laughs> but it's tiring, isn't it? The, the, these factors just count up. And so, you know, it, even, even, even so, though, you've got you to say even so, a windowsill is probably not the wisest choice for a young man in this situation. And Eutychus dozes off, and down he goes. He goes to his death in the street below, and he dies. And that's got to be a warning, hasn't it? Make sure you do your best to get some rest before you come to a long service. Verse 10, Paul went down and he threw himself on the young man. But by the way, these words are important here. He threw himself on the young man, put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed, he said, he's alive. And then he went upstairs and broke bread and ate. And after talking until daylight, he left. And the people took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted. Now, here's the thing. See, no doubt, when we had our reading earlier, um, and when you read this bit of your Bible, we naturally, and it's it's natural, we get distracted by the whole Eutychus thing. We're thinking, whoa, I mean, this is dramatic stuff. But that is not the most remarkable thing, I think, in this story. It really isn't. Now, I want to remind you what we said earlier on in the book of Acts. A rule of thumb, never get distracted by a sign. Always ask, where's this sign pointing? Yeah? It's silly. It's silly to camp out by a sign. You want to go where signs are pointing. They go, they go to a destination, don't they? The reader is supposed to recognize this miracle. Okay? It's supposed to set a little bell going off in your head. <gasps> I know this one. Okay? A young boy dies, and a man of God throws himself upon him, as, it, as it's worded here. And life returns to this young man. Do you know that story? It's formulaic. This is the story of Elijah from 1 Kings 17. You can look it up if you like. Elijah with the widow's son. The widow's son dies. The widow's distraught. Elijah goes to this boy. He throws his body on him. And the, body's, the boy comes back to life. I mean, it's right there. The bells will be going off on all of Luke's readers. So what's it about? What's the sign then pointing to? Let me read to you from 1 Kings 17. This is the story. 1 Kings 17. I'm going to read from verse 23. You can look it up if you like. Elijah, so this is after the boy's been raised. Elijah picked up the child and he carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, look, your son is alive. And the woman said to Elijah, pay attention, now I know you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord is in your mouth. The word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. This sign points to the word of the Lord. Paul is the man of God. Every word that he brings is true. 
Every word is from God. Every word is vital and life-giving and life-changing. And so the really weird thing actually about this little episode, when you think about it, if you play this out in your head, is that no sooner has Eutychus been raised, they all get straight back to what they were doing without pause. Even Eutychus, it seems, it seems like he just sort of dusts himself off, probably feeling a bit embarrassed. He killed himself in the service. And he returns to the upper room for more. That's the weird thing, surely, in this story. Notice the resurrection of Eutychus is not the focus of their attention. No, no, no. They've come to celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ in the supper together as they celebrate the Lord's Supper, a visual word from God, all true, vital, life-giving. So let me ask you again, why is this church so fruitful, so mature, so generous, so faithful, so committed to the gospel? Because the first thing on their list of what they want in a church is the word of God, the doctrine, the teaching of the apostles, clearly, fully, powerfully taught and applied amongst them. This is what will produce fruit that will last, brothers and sisters. This is what will encourage you and I as we live in our world, strengthen us to hold firm, even when the storms come. This is our vital lifeline. So let me lay a challenge as I close. You know, we at WEC, I know we have a reputation for taking the proclamation and the teaching of God's word seriously. We don't apologize for that. And we probably like to think of ourselves, don't we, as being, you know, the faithful heirs, really, of all that was good about these churches who loved and were empowered by the word of the Lord. But are we? It's time to just look at ourselves, isn't it? are we? Do we really have their zeal for the gospel? Do we really have a fire within us to, to, to give the best, to give our best workers to the work of missions? Do we treasure unity together to the point where we're willing to, to lay down our rights for our brothers and sisters to love them? Are we anxious to give all that we are able and then some just like the churches in Macedonia, that we might bless the work of the gospel and the welfare of our fellow disciples. This is the fruit of God's word in the hearts of God's people. Do we have a love and a reverence for the word of God? Not only that we love to hear it and sit here and hear it taught and explained, but a reverence for the word of God that bows the knee to whatever God says no matter how countercultural, no matter how it clashes with what we want to think or what we desire in life. And does that powerful word, that word of exhortation, strengthen our hearts? Do you feel it strengthening you as you hear it? Does it encourage us so that we're able to stand firm when rejection and persecution come our way? I am convinced Though many other things are important in church, these things will only come from keeping the word of God, the word in which Jesus Christ himself makes himself known to us, keeping that absolutely central to who we are. We must never lose that. For it is the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation. It's the Scriptures that do it. And all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man or the woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Let us hide the word of the Lord in our hearts. Let us love the word of the Lord because we love him. Father, we thank you for your powerful word which is indeed able to make us wise for salvation and to equip us for every good work. We want to be a church that loves and knows you, first of all, 
that we never lose that first love. And you have revealed yourself and your son through your Holy Spirit word. Help us to meet you on these pages, these pages that you've given us, to know you better each day, to become like you. And may the truths of this word unite us with love, move our hearts to be generous, to be faithful, and to stand firm through all the storms and trials of life and all the lies of men. For we ask it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing uh, our closing song now. We're going to sing Bless the Lord. 10,000 reasons. I'm sure we can think of even more than that why we want to bless the Lord. But let's stand together and thank, thank God for what we've received. Like that.
let's just finish with those words again from what I read earlier from Romans chapter 15. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, this is our prayer this morning as we leave here. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.